Hello again, everyone. I hope you are well. Well, we have had to redo our brief video lecture on the content, informed consent and autonomy. I think the earlier one posted has quite a challenge with the sound. And since we have some very special students amongst us with visual impairments of a kind, I only think that it is fair to redo this video. So both will be posted. The other one is a bit more elaborate in terms of uh, emphasis and you know, helping you get yourself settled in. And this will be a bit more focused just on the content, which is still what is important for you. All the other pedagogical issues can be dealt with when school resumes in NS. I would want to advise again, like I've always done, Please focus on the content that is delivered to you by a specific lecturer or instructor for that specific course you are doing, not just for our current course, Philosophical Questions, PEC 102, but I want to advise that you have that push train as level 100 who are generally speaking, maybe relatively naive to the system of the university. You shouldn't be following every news just because that content is labeled, say, philosophical questions, ACL 102, or it is labeled uh, psych, whatever, or POSA. You know, it, it, that in itself doesn't mean it is authentic. It might be coming from the same lecturer in the past, but it need not be seen as the content for the semester. So when school is fully in session and you can assess your official classroom, which is Sakai, currently that hasn't been done. Students will first register for the courses. There will be a deadline for the registration of courses. Then the registered students will be included in the site for that course. Then the course site will be ready. I'm sure by the, by the time registration has ended, all of those will be done. What we are trying to do now is whilst the classroom or the official setup is done, you have lecturers, you have instructors for courses that perhaps are able to assess their students, a large number of their students, and so are able to give them some content that is still authentic and give them enough time. When they have the, the content now, then they are able to engage it whilst they are preparing for school. So you may be, be at the shop, keeping shop for mommy or auntie. You, you could listen to a lecture in 40 minutes on a certain topic that is going to be done eventually. That's the rationale. So that when it is time and the session is opened officially, if that lecture is being conducted, the video lecture is delivered to you and we are taking questions and answers, interactive sessions on it, it will just be like a reminder for you. Now, psych yourself for that and engage the content. So that is what is being done now. You have a content for what is philosophy. You would you have a content for which introduces you to ethics in the, in the presentation two. It is the presentation three that takes a topic on ethics, and medical ethics specifically, that I think that the, the, the voice over, it was done at, at a place that wasn't very convenient, I think. So the sound doesn't come out well. I suppose that this will be better. So we are redoing it. That will be the third presentation aimed at helping you. I am not <laughs> uh, currently required to do such. I'm just supposed to wait if I like. And then when school resumes, I put my con content there on Sakai then students who assess that at the time that they are assessing their other content, when they are expected to be at live sessions for all the five or so courses that they are doing, whether they are clashing or not, et cetera, et cetera. It can be very, very, very demanding, like I've kept saying. So this is to help you. And when help comes to a student, the student has an obligation to use that help or make it pass by. Now, when Sakai is set up, finally, all the students who will be officially registered into the course then will, will be able to assess 
all other resources that are uploaded there. But in the meantime, with a week or so to get into school, you can use the time that you are registering or whatever. You can have your earpiece on, you'll be listening to, to what is uh, philosophy. Then you are listening to it whilst you are in the queue to register for something, or whilst you are buying your watch you know, somewhere, you could believe that is the rationale. So do not create an impossible situation for yourself and pride yourself in the idea that, oh, what a tedious online learning. No. How do you engage public? That is what philosophers do. And that is what we are going to help ourselves polish up in, in our life endeavors. Okay, so in this presentation, which is a, a, a redo of the previous one, I will quickly walk you to the third presentation on my screen now. You would see presentation three. Now, what did we say? Informed consent, autonomy, and ethics. We want you to have an introduction. We want you to understand informed consent from a bioethical perspective. Then we would equip ourselves with a pattern, the format, the steps to go through to claim to have achieved an informed consent from your patient. There are, there are steps, there's a pattern. We believe that uh, you, should, you should fulfill. You should ensure that you have gone through that process, those steps before you can claim you have achieved or attained an informed consent. The patient has consented, yes, but was it an informed one? That's the question. Now, why informed consent? We will emphasize why the need for informed consent, because we respect patient autonomy, we respect the dignity of a human person. A human person is not like the stone, it's not like the cattle that you can force it to do things. That is a, a disrespect, you know, to say the least of the humanness of people. So what? So we will see what the basis, the grounds for the claim for informed consent is, ethically speaking. We look at duty of the caregiver, ensure beneficence, avoid non-malfeasance, yet maintain and preserve patient's dignity by what? Ensuring autonomy. And we see that in doing those three, it will take us to the ethical dilemma. Look on the screen now. I'm walking you through the outline. Those ethical dilemmas, we will outline them and then look at a proposed response of a kind from great thinkers of our time, <laughs> Ajay and Miles, yours truly, contributing to a book, you know, production by the poor man, so and to me, also of the Department of Philosophy and Classics, you know, the philosophy section. So we will have a contribution to the discourse that we believe helps to deal with some of the ethical dilemmas to be encountered. We do not, however, pretend that we won't have certain challenges. And so the paper, that contribution also outlines what the possible challenges could be if we even took a relational account of person, just like any philosophical position, we try to respond to the possible counter that will come. You will see those references. I will ask for permission and get those pages copied for you. And so, like I have said already, if you need a hard copy of the materials that you would read for the course, send me your lecture a request tell me you want it i will seek permission because these books are copyrighted so we cannot allow people to just exploit the intellectual property of others and then they make sales out of it and sell to thousands and thousands of students and make profits when they have never stepped foot anywhere <laughs> nor thought of writing anywhere it cannot continue like that Okay, so the least you can do is at least respect yourself, respect the institution, respect academic property, you know, and tell me.
apart from even that, we wouldn't also want people sending you content. They are selling packaged materials everywhere because they think they, they, are, they are the ones conducting your assessment. They are teaching you and they will build you. You end up getting confused because the package you go and buy from somewhere because people know that level 100, they don't know any they know is this is the PR, uh, the 102 <laughs> handout. Then they just go and buy. And then you have so many things that will not be captured for the semester in test. This goes for all your courses. So I will have so much work having to take note of who and who requested for what. But it is fine, I don't mind at all. I won't even let you go to teaching assistant yet. Sem the semester hasn't started officially. You cannot ask them to do such uh, you know, extra work. Send the request directly to me. Some of you have done so, I have kept record. Indicate just your name, I don't need your ID yet. ID is for exam. I don't need to know who script I'm marking, but I need to know who has requested for what and with which, what campus. If the copies are done, you will come pay my request and send them to those who asked for it directly. In, in batches that will make sure we take care of our COVID protocols, you walk into the office, you pick the copy, you step out quietly and go and study it. You don't think you need it, you are not obliged to. The soft versions, slides cannot have all the, the content on the paper. No, that's not what slides are. They are PowerPoints. They are pointers to help you. So you get them. You get um, interactive time. So we will. you ask me questions on what you have studied, read. I will refer you to the content. You can buy the book or the better online, you know, and all that. But that is how we will progress, okay? My dear friends, so I just want you to be guided and minded. You don't see a Zoom link somewhere. You say the, the doc says you should meet. Then before long, someone who has never ever stepped foot anywhere near university is exploiting you, asking you to meet somewhere and pay X, Y, or Z amount and sit there and be taught anything. You have to have correct, accurate information. And that is why I've taken that upon myself, giving you numbers and the fact that you entered into the system and you came to meet COVID and it's claimed online teaching that we are all getting accustomed to, okay? So you won't even have the opportunity of entering the lecture hall in person once to go and meet your lecturer, then your lecturer will tell you all those other uh, information you are receiving are not from you. You won't have that. So you have to get direct access to the instructor for the course. And then if she tells you, contact Joseph Watten, is one of my TAs, I've assigned him to do X, Y, or Z. You know, you took that authorization in which, you know, from your lecture. So you are at a safe place. And we have people of integrity to serve as your teaching assistant. Period. Be careful how over enthusiastic people try to claim to be helping you and they rather put you somewhere. All right. That was from my sister to fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord. Now we can continue. So for informed consent, this content that I'm dealing with, the introduction says, in contemporary medical care, the idea of informed consent by mentally competent patients or their chosen legal representative is considered a strict and universal ethical and legal requirement for research involving human beings. In fact, even sometimes animals for diagnostic, therapeutic, interventional, or socio-behavioral health studies, especially when you are administering health to patients. So the whole paragraph that you will have the time to read over and over again, those who have been asking for slides, the slides will be there. This is the video, you can download them. I think I made them downloadable. If you don't have access to downloading, let me know, I will do that. I will activate that or something on YouTube. I'm still finding my way on YouTube to make your lives easier, okay? So if something doesn't go well, then prompt me so I can check. Now, listen, it is a legal and ethical requirement. It is not, oh, if I decide, I, I think that if I tell her that the, 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 the health you know, procedure will lead to her inability to give, if I tell her that she will be sad, so I won't tell her. I think I should protect her sad 
and hair from being sad. Who told you? You are required to inform that patient or that person you are interviewing that this is the implication of what I am asking. If I take this information and that information from you, say you are interviewing a cancer patient or a, excuse me, someone who has had HIV or something like that for your research, you are supposed to give every information and we are going together. That is what we mean before. And then the person can make an informed decision whether he or she is willing to subject herself or himself to that research or to that procedure. Maybe you want to enlarge her hips. She has come to you, enlarge my hips. I like big hips, <laughs> you know. Tell her all the fine people who have enlarged their hips through your institution, that's fine. But when you finish, make sure you are telling her the risk or telling him the risk, the alternatives he or she has. Not that because you can do only the cut and paste one, you insist that it is only cut, cut and paste kind of hips I can do for you. And then after three months, the sister's hips are changing position and she cannot sit near you know, the fireplace to have a romantic dinner with a friend. Meanwhile, it is because of this friend, she came for the hips, give the alternatives that the person has. You may not have that alternative, but for informed consent, for her consent to be an informed one, my dear friend, you are required legally ethically to give all relevant information based on which she or he can decide to either consent or decline. Okay, so what is informed consent? Look at that, we want you to understand what it means to have an informed consent. It is a process of steps of information by the caregiver which is what understood by the care seeker. It has to be understood, not just given to her, but she must understand it. So you have a huge responsibility as a caregiver to make your patient research, the person you are researching on her, understand. Not just know, but understand. You see the demand? The understand what the end product of that which he or she is consenting to or rejecting. You see, that is that is basically it. So we want to stress that not just the patient's consent, but her what informed consent. Take note of that. Now, a process, I, I guess read that, excuse me. <clears throat> Her informed consent. In other words, as an ethical doctrine, informed consent can be simply described as a process of communication which enables a patient with what extant capacity to reason to make what informed and voluntary decisions. So it is a communication process which ensures, which requires that the patient has the capacity to reason, extant capacity to reason, not partial one, not one that is undergoing psychological stress, not one that just heard the bad news. And they want him or him or her, you know, to make a decision about something else immediately. He is not in the right frame of mind. So he's not in doesn't have the capacity to reason for that moment. Not someone in labor, like I keep saying, and you ask, should we cut off your tubes at all for you because the stress you go through during the by is too much. The person is pushing the baby and says, should we can she say cut it, cut it, cut it, cry I'm suffering. Cut it off. She has consented, but this is not an informed one because she didn't have that extant capacity to reason. Not when the person is overly excited because of the joy she's feeling about something. Say, so, wow, should we add more? Should we add more? Take keep adding. Keep adding. Be careful, you might have to face legal charges after. And then not just the capacity to reason, but the decision must be voluntary. Sometimes the person has that, you know, reasonable capacity to reason, 
but then it looks as if he or she is being compelled to make that decision because of the way the competent other, the competent other here refers to the physician, the specialist, the doctor, maybe the spiritualist, you know, the uh, herbalist, whichever authority that claims to be uh, helping to deliver health to the patient. Because of how this authority, this competent other, quote unquote, is presenting the case, it makes it almost impossible to have a choice in the matter. That decision that the patient ultimately makes then will not be considered as a voluntary one. If you don't have, decide right now, yeah, I don't know what I'll do. The herbs will dry up. We need it wet so that you can do. If you want to, let me do it now. So I'm waiting. Okay, do it, do it. That is a choice. That is supposed to be a consent. But is it an informed one if this, the patient was so compelled to choose? In other words, forcing someone to choose. Would it be a choice in itself? Really? Well, we'll see. So the demand is that the patient should have that capacity to reason. Ethically speaking, if you are feeling informed consent, then you are communicating in a way to who? To a, a person that can reason in, and to, to do what? And allowing that person to make a voluntary decision. Just a voluntary decision? No, a voluntary decision based on what? Information that is relevant to that procedure. And what kind of information should that be? We'll get there in a minute. Take note, therefore, that if I put my, my signature to a paper, that in itself cannot constitute informed consent, then ethically speaking, unless the content has fulfilled all the preceding uh, uh, requirements. Okay, so what? So if you just put your signature to a paper, we cannot claim that that is enough. You see, such a contest has not adequately allowed the patient the opportunity of changing his or her mind upon reconsultation. The person must have that opportunity to reconsult. Maybe it is the hospital that is unable to respond to that fibroid situation, you know, given the research available at a time. Perhaps a specialist somewhere outside of that context may be able to give an alternative, a specialist in traditional orthodox medicine, perhaps, or what we call the alternative medicine, the traditional one, as in herbs. Maybe herbs could cure COVID, hands down. <laughs> How do you know? You see? So you, when you get to the point where it seems that there isn't an available research resource to help deal with a situation for your institution or for scientific medicine as it is now. You have to give the patient that alternative. Well, you could go to pray if you want to, but I think you should go this way because of X, Y, and Z. You could try, some people would tell you, for the nature of the fibroid that you have, you cannot keep them. Now that is not for you to say, friends. If you are doing empirical study, you do not have that capacity to tell someone that you cannot. What you should say, which you are entitled to, is the research available to us currently will not or cannot support childbirth. That is a conditional statement. It is the research available to science currently, or to our institution, or to the West African so and so and so, or to, you know, so you make it a condition so that the person say, well, okay, maybe not in West Africa, maybe not in Africa, maybe I, I could try Europe, or maybe not in Europe, not in China, but I could try Africa. So you give the patient an alternative, not you impose yours because you feel you are the final authority. That is paternalistic, take note of that word, I will ask you. It is as if you are enforcing your, your choice on the patient because you have, so to speak, the know-how. 
but he is a patient or she is a patient. She must have a say. To so give an opportunity for a change of mind upon reconsultation. Now that is, a, there's a caveat there why it is possible. So we are dealing with the ethical aspect. Remember, the doctor must ensure beneficence. You saw that in the second presentation. The doctor or the physician must ensure non malfeasance do not cause harm. So we want to respect autonomy and allow the patient to choose. But we have an obligation, I say we here referring to the physician, we have an obligation to benefit the patient, do that which benefits the patient, that's tough. And even furthermore, to avoid anything that would cause harm. What a, what a twist and turn. How do you reconcile all the three, okay? You said that, in case there's a new information on treatment, the patient must know. So it is all information, 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 clearly communicated on the screen now highlight, highlighted in yellow. Look at it, please. That information must be clearly communicated in a language easily understood by the patient. Don't go all English on that poor Asante man. Don't go all ga on that poor English person, vice versa. Sometimes, yes, the person can speak the English, is, the person is English, but you are all technical, talking scoliosis of the lung, whatever. And the person is just more than very impressed that, wow, I should be in the safe hands. I think I believe I'm in the safe hands now. This guy really knows his stuff. That is, it's just, applauding your intellectual you are, has no clue what you're talking about before he wakes up and finds his God-given manhood cut off. My friend, is that what you meant with all that nice thing you were saying over there? Oh, yes. Your <laughs> African pride as a man has been cut off without your permission. But you signed the thing. Yes, I signed it because the doctor said, you know, uh, you know, the scoliosis of the uh, something. And I thought that it looked fine the way he was saying it. Well, yes, that meant your, your leg was going to be cut off. Apologies, dear friend, okay, if you have any such scenario around you, family or friends or yourself. But if it, you, you would just be told that, look, what it means when we say you are going to have a CS. It means we are going to cut you open and take those twins out. And then when we finish, we will sew it back. And we will be careful not to leave a scissor or a scissor, whatever, continue somewhere. But we have done so many of such. So these are the benefits of that. You won't have to push the baby out and expand places and you know have to deal with closing up the place later. You can time it and make sure that you get your baby on the day that you intended her or him to come. Maybe it fits some other numerological <laughs> concerns you have in your religion or your, your timetable for your PhD or something like that. Those are the benefits. But the, the risk are also X, Y, and Z. As we know, there may even be others. So you make that choice. Then you give the patient time reflect on it don't compel people that's a consultation you shouldn't be doing this no 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 you have to give the information that they need yes it is dangerous to think of having triplets because of your peculiar need for blood of a certain type you we wouldn't want you to engage in this medically speaking before we are supposed to ensure beneficence that will benefit you and avoid anything that will be a malfeasance to you. But we also have to respect your autonomy. The person wants the 10th child, Bedujain, that's if you're an Asante person, you know, wants the 10th child so that she can be the queen mother of her home <laughs> among the other wives. You don't know what, they, what that means to this person, but you can help her see that, but this is your third child and already, your womb is that weak. Your uterus is falling apart. So you show her or him, you bring in the other part of her if she gives you that permission to understand, then you make it a choice for her. 
This is what we are discussing. Clearly communicate in a language that the person understands. Showing on the screen, you can see where is my highlighter? Showing the strength of that, med uh, of that procedure or medication, okay? Why the person needs it, I'm highlighting stuff now, the risk, the benefits, the alternatives. If you are getting what I've said now, then the rest of the slides are just for emphasis. So look on the screen now, you will see purpose, benefit, risk, understanding. I've said all of that. Why the plastic surgery? Why not another kind of surgery? A heart fit type of plastic surgery? Will you fill it in or you cut a portion and replace it somewhere? You know, why a heart surgery? What is the risk? Can the person leave some two years extra per scientific research currently, which might change anyway? But can he do two years extra rather than the risk of a heart surgery, which is 40% positive, 60% negative? Let the patient decide if he or she wants a heart surgery. Don't use the patient for trial and error of your skill. <laughs> Does the cancer patient understand what it means to do chemotherapy? Or you are all that concerned? about how she will, she will continue living and you are not telling her the implications okay, on her hair or some people, on her emotions, etc. Someone may decide after a period of time that look, do not take me through this difficult time. I would rather want to have some three months of a good time communicating with my Lord making sure that I'm setting things right in my home and then go home quietly, home here referring to the afterlife. If the person believes in that, I would want that. Then insisting on living in a world where I cannot step out because I have changed so much, et cetera, et cetera. You have to help the patient make that informed decision where it is possible. <laughs> That's very important, where it is possible and it will not lead to the other. Other concerns of beneficence and normal feasance raised. Okay, now, you should, on this screen now, the, the emphasis is, you should give the patient the right to withdraw. I'm talking about here, even the emphasis on research. You want to know uh, uh, what the effect that they, I mean, you're interviewing an HIV patient or someone whose relatives died from COVID or something like that. Very delicate matter, very hurting. Uh, people are almost cautious about how to live with such people who have a certain condition, you know. But you need that data also to help improve our health, health, you know, situation for everyone. You should, it is an ethical obligation on you to inform the patient or the person you are researching for information from that they have the right to withdraw from that study at any time. You cannot compel people because they agree to give you some information from time you, you keep doing your research. And then now they, you are getting into some details about their life that they wish they wouldn't disclose. They say, well, but if they don't want to talk again, they should say they are withdrawing. You should tell them you have an obligation to tell them that, I mean, if you do not want to give me that information, please, you are, you are able to withdraw. You have a right to stop giving me that information now. It's very important. If you don't do it, you can be held liable, legally speaking. Then we are supposed to ensure confidentiality of personal identity. So all of that comes from uh, are included in the informed consent bit. You do not go disclosing people's health issues to other people to make a point. Oh, my dear friend, this thing, even uh, the president of so and so had this condition. I'm the one who took care of him. He didn't struggle to do this thing. You know, so there you go, giving our people's personal issues, health wise, even ordinarily, we wouldn't want you to, let alone health wise. So, informed consent especially in clinical trials, 
includes confidentiality of the identity of persons who you are either administered medication to or you sought information from. So on the screen, you see the disclosure, comprehension, analytical competence, and voluntary, uh, voluntary consent. These are the four steps, if you like, the pattern, the process to follow to ensure informed consent. First of all, disclosure, disclose the information to the person. We will have to cut you open to bring these babies up. Forgive my bias, for examples, having to do with labor. Okay, My mother of four, by God's grace. In fact, three, I went for three, but God gave me four. So the labor situation is so, yeah, you know, <laughs> I always have that in mind. It's so glaring to me, or it's so fresh to me, almost every day. And therefore, if you have sat under my tutelage for a while, you know that I like to give such examples when I'm doing uh, anything health in our discussion. But think about that. Disclose the information to the patient. Tell him or her, you have this condition and that is why you are going through that. You can do it with a lot of tact, a lot of wisdom, a lot of compassion, but you have to be clear, state it clearly. Do not be ambiguous about it. Don't say, oh, your heart is just, um, I think there's a little thing wrong with how your heart is going, but we'll see about that. It's not for you to decide that for the person. Tell the person you have an enlarged heart. And that means you can die today. You know, I mean, if that is what it means, say it that that means with a lot of touch, a lot of psychological management of the situation. But the truth is necessary so that the person can make an informed decision. So disclosure, then comprehension. It's not enough to say you have trypanosomiasis. What is that? <laughs> You can't tell them later, but I told you that you have diabetes of the Q type. You know, you have disclosed yet, but what does it mean? Understanding, so open it out. That is where we have already discussed, not just trans translating the language that is accessible to the person, as in language, as in Gatri, English, Latin, French, that's good. But even further on, accessible language, not the doctor's technical language. Speak in a way that the patient clearly understands. We have to cut off one of your legs respectfully. After you have managed the situation and you have spoken in a way that I'm going to give you an information about what we have diagnosed. You know, you have a diabetic, whatever. And so we notice that the sore that you have in the accident Excuse me, yeah. If I'm hitting on some conditions that you have encountered before, I'm just helping us see something here. So don't get too with that. Okay, so you tell the person your soul is going all the way up. And if we do not amputate, it might get all the way to the knee and up, and then it might not be able to help. That amputate word may sound so accessible to you, but the patient may not understand that. So it actually mean we have to cut it up, up to the knee. And then the alternative we'll have is, well, we could fix another one. We could do the, the, the one that will fix. There's one that you can work with after some uh, physiotherapy, or there's one that you don't fix anything at all, but you blah, 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 blah. You know, so you the person can decide. That's comprehension. I'm, I'm using a scenario to explain that. Analytical competence. When you want people to really analyze the situation, you don't stand on them instantly after you have given uh, the, the impression. You say, so decide, that's the book, that's the paper, please. I'll, I'll be in my office when you decide that you call me. Who tells you that? Unless it's an emergency situation, and that is where the, the you and I are examining which one should come first, beneficence, non-morphisance, autonomy, who is deciding for who should the family decide for people who are incompetent analytically at the time? The guy gave her a broken heart. It's so bad, she has thrown her baby out of the, her, her room. She has 
thrown her baby outside and she's walking naked. So we know that she's going off. And that's why she has been brought to a certain institution for help. That is still part of the discussion we are having. How do we help her? Who is supposed to decide on informed consent? If we want to administer a certain medication or a certain health procedure or take her to a certain therapeutic process. Hmm? Who is going to sign that consent? Or who is going to consent to that inform? I mean, who's going to give us an informed consent? It can't, it can't be that patient, I think. But should it be the doctor without recourse to the communal aspect of the person? The AJ and Miles paper give a rendition, an understanding of personhood that makes room for that possibility. Okay. So I, I just went ahead of myself. We are back to our slide there. Analytical competence, and then afterwards, a voluntary consent or, if you like, refusal. All of what I've said is already on the screen. So, case to case right to autonomous decision to refuse treatment. Okay, it secures the patient's autonomy. Why do we need to ensure informed consent? I said that in the introduction. It underlies or underscores what the dignity of the human person. You have to treat people as humans. And if you do that, then you cannot talk across them. Sometimes people discuss people who are going to be, uh, uh, I mean, the patient. They discuss the patient as if she's, she's a dead person sitting there. She doesn't have a stick. And what is her doctor should be there and say, what do you think? Should we cut off the womb or should we do this? Look out, who we'll asks them? see what we should do. And the patient is lying there, perhaps in coma, you think, but she is a patient. So it is very important what we do. I, I think I gave a scenario in the other one. I hope I remember all those fine examples I gave to buttress the point. A scenario where someone who had a convulsive you know, uh, attack was coming into the pharmacy shop. I was there then sometime after senior high, I think. He wanted to come and get a drug. He entered the shop and he got an attack. He came with a, a, an attendant. And so he was convulsing, wriggling himself in the shop there, hitting his head against the glass frames there. You know, and we wanted to help. The original pharmacist wasn't there yet. So myself and then the owner of the shop, but then the, the cashier, wanted to assist. The attendant that came with him said, don't touch him. Don't try it. If he's in that situation, he doesn't want to be touched. But we say, but he's breaking his head and he's destroying everything in the shop. He will pay any cost you give him after this. He will, pay. he will settle. But his instruction is when he's in that scenario, don't touch him. This is our shop. Well, that is what he has said. But if he spoils everything, he will pay. But we are the health professionals. You walk into our institution, please don't touch him. What do you do? <laughs> what do you do when you are told that person, like the other examples I gave you in the previous video, hmm? person needs the blood to be able to get through the heart surgery. But he says, I don't take the life of another person into my life. You have killed me if you do that. I don't exist any longer. The other person lives inside me because the life of the person is in the blood. I don't believe in that as, a, as me, Nancy. But I understand the rationale behind those who believe in that. Understanding someone does not mean agreeing with the person. But you should see the fate of that person. It is that fate that has kept him away alive up to now, that he has become whoever he or she is. So if you want the person to see something differently from the way you see it, you have to show it. You don't force it. You don't, uh, uh, what's the other way? Uh, uh, assume it and project it and say, yeah, you power. So I want to let your triplets die because of that cheap feed. That is not your place <laughs> to say, friends. You are a thinker. You are supposed to give the patient the information that you are a sickle cell patient. You have used so much blood. You need a replacement to be able to go through this surgery. 
for your three babies. You may lose them. Give time. You could even do this at by the second month or so, even before pregnancy, if you are able to, if you had that luxury of time. If it is an emergency situation that has come to the hospital and doctors feel obliged to save life, that is a whole ball game. We don't throw away the ethics, but that is where you and I, the philosophical thinkers, reflecting ethically on matters, can make a case either for or against. So there's the scenario I gave you in, in presentation two, asking for your view on what Eja Ben Tum should do, is a real situation that you can encounter. And as a consultant or an ethicist or the head of an institution, you may have to lead a discussion to defend your people. You may be the legal brain of that institution who decided to maybe overlook something and did the other one at court. What case would you make? And then they tell you, if you do philosophy, you won't get a job to do. <laughs> That's another discussion altogether. You are all over the place. In fact, you are multi-taxing if you are placing your cards well and you understand where you stand. Okay, my dear friends. So I'm just saying that the dignity of the human person is the reason why you cannot just determine what you think is good for that patient when it comes to his or her health. That patient may tell you, let me die. In fact, I see heaven open. I wish you were seeing me as I do this illustration. A patient may tell you, don't worry about my dying. I see heaven open, the son of man welcoming me. Here you are concerned about making the person leave. So you want to give him or her blood that she hasn't asked you. So if you're able to convince that person, that's fine. The matter is different when this is an underage person and the decisions are being made by his or her parents or guardians or those who oversee her welfare. This is maybe a seven year old or 12 year old. And she needs the blood to survive. And then some folks, parents, whatever, say no. That is a different discussion. That's why you should see the various aspects of a matter when we are discussing or when we are deciding ethically on something. It cannot be a general rule for everyone. It will engage on consequentialism and deontology. Of course, we will not use health or bioethics. We might use business ethics. And then that might conclude our discussions on ethics. And we can move to some other philosophical questions, metaphysical ones, and then hopefully uh, epistemological ones and sociopolitical ones. If we give you all those five, I think sociology students will benefit from some philosophy, political science students would. Uh, what's the other one? Those who are doing some medicine ultimately will benefit if you have a legal intuition of a kind who will benefit the politician and so on. Okay, that's the rationale. So you would see how philosophy is operating as what a second order activity in helping to deal with practical problems of existence. So you have seen the one on the screen already, beneficence, non morphism you have seen that. We are not only interested in ensuring that justice, there is autonomy, but we already had saw this. We want to make sure that we do that which benefits the patient only. That is the principle of beneficence on your screen. Then the principle of non malfeasance and special students, let me read those for you, beneficence. This principle prescribes that the caregiver ought to take an action only if it benefits the patient. That's the principle of beneficence. Then the principle of non malfeasance This principle prescribes that the caregiver avoids any action that causes harm to the patient. Eh, to the patient. Non Malfeasance is spelled non maleficence. I say it that way so you can spell it properly. Okay. Now, the physician is supposed to uphold the joint principles of beneficence, non malfeasance, while respecting patient autonomy all at once. That generates ethical dilemmas. Decision making that is difficult because it looks like either way there is a problem created. That's what a dilemma is. If it is not clear to you, Google, find the meaning of dilemma. Okay? Ethical dilemma, a decision-making 
about what is right or wrong in a contest. And it looks like either way, there will be rightness or wrongness. So you have to choose the greater good if you like, or the one that has less evil associated with it. It's difficult. That's why it's a dilemma. There is a fundamental ethical dilemma entailed in the simultaneous demand for understood or informed consent on the one hand, and the requirement for beneficence and non malfeasance on the other. That's one, there's a tension. Hmm? How can you demand informed consent, okay, from a person who is already declared incompetent from start? Incompetent in the, in the health condition he or she is in. That is why he's at the hospital or she's at the hospital. She doesn't know how she can make herself well. So from start, the patient doesn't know. So if you want us to depend on what the patient says, is there no, no uh, doesn't it create a problem already? It does. It will mean that her information would still depend on what the doctor or the authority tells her. So no matter, it looks like as if no matter how much information, risk, benefit, alternative, etc., that is made available to her, it will still depend on what the doctor decided to review. So there seems to be a tension in whether there can, any, there can be any autonomy after all, an autonomous decision after all, if the patient from start is what uh, described or seen as what the incompetent one. That's the point, that's the ethical dilemma. Like it, it's like you can't have autonomy after all. Now note, informed consent, so I'm explaining that in, in written statement for you, so you can easily grasp it. Informed consent requires that the patient be competent, understands the choice, okay? Yet the patient is at the same time expected to depend on the competent other as a physician, a specialist, for knowledge which influences or detects her supposed informed choice. So I will have to depend on the doctor. It is the doctor that is influencing, in fact, in certain contexts, that is determining the choice I make ultimately because I'm the incompetent one. The doctor is the competent one. So where is this supposed claim or demand that I, the patient, I have to make the choice? It looks like it is something you can never achieve. I'm talking about autonomy. The dilemma then is how to determine whether a choice of consent or refusal which has been made is actually an informed one. How informed can informed consent be? Maybe you can think of writing a paper on that. <laughs> then the ethical dilemma too. Another level of tension arises in the simultaneous demand for both informed consent and the requirements of beneficence and non malfeasance that one I think I've over elaborated in this video and the previous one that didn't come out well. I won't take, I don't want to take over the other one. Let's see. Okay, so you can listen to both if you are able to. But see, I have said that over and over again, beneficence, non malfeasance and yet at the same time, we want autonomy. Can we, in simple terms, in respecting the autonomy of the patient and pursuing informed consent, the physician may be exposing the patient to harm. That will do it. That will undermine the principle of non malfeasance You want to respect this autonomy before long. The drunkard, all drunk to a pub, who was brought to your hospital, is the one that you have to wait for to determine whether that surgery should be should be done on him or not. But he came drunk. So in your bid to respect patient autonomy, or so that he can make, he or she can make an informed consent. If you want to do that, then you have to drain out all the alcohol and make him come out a bit rational and check with him if it's okay to stitch that part of her chest, which is exposing her heart. Who tells you that? Wouldn't you have committed, uh, uh, undermined the principle of non malfeasance The second part is, could, wouldn't you have omitted to do that which benefits the patient? So there comes that tension. Which one would you 
do and why. Now the class will discuss several instances. You are the class. You will bring them now that the lecture has been delivered to you. The same content maybe will be uploaded also on Sakai after all the registrations are done. Like I've told you, registration will be done by you, the student. That data will be collected and then put into your classroom, Sakai. Then the lecturer will walk into your classroom. So until that is done, I don't have any place to uh, connect with students and say, I put a content here, I put a content there or that. Okay, that is why you are lucky. I haven't done that yet with, with my other classes. You are lucky. lucky you have the site, it is an official site. I have communicated with the class. Invariably, I think we have more than four platforms now. I think this is the fourth one we have created. And then there's the fifth on its way. So for a class of main campus, 900 and something, almost 1,000, the campus, 300 and something, almost 400. If we have about, so I, I think we have contacted close to 1,000 students already. Hopefully, they are all students. Thousand. That's a, a good chunk of the class. You should assess the content from the site that you have. If you subscribe, then it makes it easy. I don't even know what else goes into this thing, but at least you can, I know you can get the videos now. That is what is important to me. You get them directly from me. If I have to edit something, I know I'm reaching out to you directly. So be careful about copied and passed on, copied and passed or forwarded download it here and there, it can get a bit more. Go to the source. Those of you who are Christians of the denomination, that I think I am in. Eh? We don't believe in mediation. There's only one mediator, Christ. Okay, then I go to the Father through him, directly, no mediation. So we respect the authorities. I was telling my, my happy class executives that we, we respect all authorities. We honor those who honor you. But nobody has the, the keys, you know, the access to the room. I see my daddy is asleep, come data. Who tells you? We have direct access to the throne room. That's the glorious call for my faith. Okay. And so I want students, all of you who are able to hear this and who will hear it later on to come directly to the throne room of grace, so to speak, okay? That's why I've given you my contact directly. Send me a message for clarity on anything. Of course, if I have communicated on that and I've told you go so and so place and read, I don't want 100 students coming one after the other. And then where should I go and read it? Doc, please, what time? Doc, please, where should I go? When I have already communicated, when you come, I tell you go to where I told you to go to. That one I go to, because I want to teach you how to fish not just to be giving you fish, it won't help you, okay? But you have direct access to me, your team of TAs will also be there. Do some work for yourself. It's part of the discipline so that you are honored, you are given an honorary degree, not you come and excuse me, your position is still SHS, no. You are in the university, so you search for knowledge and re search for knowledge. So we do research. You search, you get it, then you search again. It's a push train. It's not you sit and wait and it comes to you, then you sit and wait and it comes to you. That's not a push train. Okay. Therefore, the class will discuss several instances where the patient disagrees with the recommendation of the professional health giver on what it is in the patient's best interest, medically speaking. You will bring those scenarios. We'll take them and then we will reflect on them and it will bring out the understanding better. So it's not all abstract, 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 but it is really practical. We can connect to it. We are able to influence that district, uh, the policy at the district level. We are able to do that. That is what philosophy does. It's not some old man's, you know, long beard, quote and unquote, kind of discipline. No, no, I'm not. That old. I'm, I'm quite grown, I think, but not that old. All right. Now, a proposed response to the dilemma. We have some few minutes to end by Ajay and Miles. Okay. Which dilemma? Where we do not know if we can always 
rely necessarily on pursuing autonomy? How should we define the autonomy of the patient? That is what uh, Ajay now make a contribution to from the African, you know, typically communal, take note of the use of the term communal push, not communitarian necessarily. They are not the same. When you get to level 300, you understand communitarianism versus individualism. Whether there is any system currently running as such is another question, okay? But something of liberal setting and all that, we will discuss that. But we are talking about an African setting, which is known for its communality, relationality. You know, the African doesn't think in terms of I, me, myself. When we are speaking, we will see, uh, we will see to, to it. Maybe you have a complaint, so, oh, okay, we'll see to it and, and, and take care of it. But then we hear, <laughs> the person who will do it is what I, I will see to it and correct that error. I will correct it. But the African is a bit uncomfortable with a language that says I, I, me, myself, you know? Why? Because it is in our cultural setting. It is in the way we do things. You see what I think we do things. So the African, generally speaking, you know, not all African, but generally speaking, the African would think in terms of what communality. So if I come to your institution and I tell you to change my face, from a woman, a beautiful one at that. I am, oh yes. <laughs> to that of a dog with a lot of beard, for example. That's, that is supposed to be my right being expressed, autonomous right as a, an individual, so to speak. Our argument in that paper is that you cannot say the same for the African. The African doesn't think of persons as just what individual. There's another paper you should look at, the level 200 look at it. I'll, I think I'll post it for you to just review, to see the argument for personhood made by mouth. Okay, yours too. Now I'm saying that, so you can think of the human person, if you are speaking from an African orientation, you can think of the human person as an individual. So she has come, change her face to that of a dog. Then you also do, you say, well, she chose it, it's her right. Some things of human persons as, yes, individual. In other words, they have right, human persons have right, they have, excuse me, they have right, they have choices, they are autonomous. But at the same time, and necessarily as part of their nature, we emphasize the fact that we, Africa, human persons are also what? communal at once, they are related. So if you came to change your face to a, a, a good face, have you forgotten that you have an obligation to your children? They, they need to come home and meet what? Their mother, not a dog, excuse me. You, you can't take that right from them. You, you want to project your right to own the face that you choose. So you have changed your face. To that of a dog, but you just deprived your children the face of their mother. Have you forgotten that that is their right also? What is the connection to the discussion here? That is the, the connection then is the institution cannot say, Oh, she has come and signed to change her face, so that is why we have respected her right. We would have to consider the communality of the person also. Maybe not everything, not to, to the chief and the president and everyone know, but we are concerned when we want to cut off a wound. It can't be that sister alone who has come and said that before you cut it off. No, you will be up. You will have to bring your partner, if you have one, or bring someone else related to you in a certain way. You don't have any immediate family, family for, for, for any human person goes beyond biological relations. Some have foster parents, some have a, a what guardian, what are you? So the paper that I mentioned to you earlier, the idea and mouse paper that they contributed to, and uh, what does it say? In their personhood, autonomy and informed consent, J and Mouse in 2019 proposed what a relational account, take note of personhood, which in their view, takes account of the equal values of what? 
communality and solidarity in defining who a person is, not just individuality. So personhood is larger than individuality so that you go pursuing rights without equal recourse to what? Persons, relational or relationality. Let me say that for now. Okay. So if you are Nancy and so you have your right, remember you are Uncle Bo's daughter. That's my father. See, you're Uncle Bo's daughter and you are Michael's mother. You are Emmanuel's mother. You are Gabriela and Gabriel's mother at once. So you are a daughter and a mother all at once. You cannot pursue one and think that it doesn't affect the other. So you have come, media. I, I don't want to give it again. Got to talk. Says who? Which part of you? Your individuality only? What about your communality? When there is that conflict, which one overrules the other? That debate is going on also in Miles paper. That paper is 2018, I think. The individual in the individualism communality debate. I think you can download that uh, online. Uh, Google Miles, the individual, I think you can get it. Just read and have an idea of the case made for who a person is and how that is influencing our discussion here in this paper, showing that you could therefore do what? Rely on what? The communality of persons who are unable to express that direct autonomy, you see, which comes with what? Individuality. So the, the person has, has gotten broken heart, so she can't make a decision about whether she should be given that injection or not. The, can the father, the mother, the uncle, the custodian, the one taking care of her, this foster parent, can they make that decision on her behalf? Is it possible? I ask it as a question rather than stating it because it would have some consequences. Which consequences are that? The family could send the patient in coma off to an early grave so that <laughs> his or her inheritance can be dispersed earlier than she wishes. I mentioned that in the previous video. Please, I think our father is in too much pain. Kill him. <laughs> Maybe they won't say kill him. They say, let him have a peaceful rest. And it is not sincere at all. It's just a push to the other world, a quick push so that the resources will be set loose for sharing. It could also be a genuine one. Please give him the blood in a Jabintum scenario that I gave you earlier in presentation too. You should see those presentations before you, you come to the table because it's a continuous lecture only presented in bits and pieces for accessibility. If you haven't studied that one, some of the things I'm saying here may not be too clear to you. Okay, so you refer to them. But Ija Bentum's family could say, look, give him the blood. Especially where Ija Bentum is incapacitated, mm? rationally, competently, maybe he's in coma. We have waited and waited, and it is becoming dangerous to his health, or it, the whole family cannot raise any money again. I mean, maybe six months he's there. Could we rely on that? Could we? It's a question. Can, can there be ethical implications? Would we be infringing on the person's right? Hey, it's a, it's, it's a difficult issue. Now. The case that we make, however, is that that should be possible. That should be possible. Okay. So sometimes the spiritualist that you go into may impose a certain help on you, you and them. That place there, book, book cry is not plenty there. In recent times, I've heard that some do a lot of uh, uh, recording of entries and exits, <laughs> you know. But if you go to a typical herbalist, you can kill it, you can kill it, At the entrance, they make sure you, they, uh, you, know, you enter your, your outpatient records. Anyway, is it possible? That's the case, Eric. But remember that whilst we doubt the possibility of family making a case for or, or consenting on behalf of the incapacitated other, okay, the, the man has lost memory. Hmm? He's a cherished grandpa. He has lost his memory. 
So how do we expect grandpa to decide whether his land should be operated upon or not when it has implications on his welfare? His kidney is failing him. We have to, the doctor says, we have to issue that procedure or, or, or start that procedure in earnest. We say autonomy, so we should, we should wait for grandpa. Someone may have to make that decision, right? We don't trust, but what is the other way out? That is the case, the ethical dilemma, okay? We are also saying that the doctor or the physician, if left to it, could also be extremely paternalistic. Sometimes might even take bribe to kill the person quickly so that the one who will inherit will bring him his or her paternity. So it, it goes both ways. We, when the person is declared or the person is extremely incompetent. So how, to what extent can we demand of what autonomy when we are trying to ensure beneficence and non malfeasance Down here, you see the reference to the book that the contribution has been made from where we will extract, I've said it over and over again, and help we get access. We will seek permission from our publishers and run those copies. You want a copy, you make a request for it. I had, I have already mentioned, the next video I plan hopefully by the grace of God to upload if I'm able to do it. I am editing them here and there for easy, so that they will be accessible to you, to be something you can assess easily, you know, and then be able to engage. So if I'm able to do that in a day or two, then you will see that also uploaded. If you hit the notification, then Anytime something is loaded, you can you can get a prompt because I may not always remember immediately to have to come and remind you I've loaded something and people go there, you know. So just do as you are told. If it won't hurt you, if it won't take anything from you, you are good to go. And then those that are downloadable, I do not know uh, if you can see them and they are downloadable. You are allowed to. I don't think I'll have any issue with that, okay? The next topic we'll discuss uh, we will we'll do the ethics discussion, for, uh, the second ethics discussion. So hopefully if things go as planned, we'll have two discussions for ethics, ethical questions, two discussion questions for metaphysical questions, two for epistemological ones, and then two for social and political related questions. And then that should end your semester. But since your assessments will be done concurrently, you will do continuous assessment. Every week you will have an assessment. So whilst you are learning the uploaded content, video, readings, what have you, you will be attending some live sessions to engage your clarification, engage your lecture directly for your TAs, for tutorials, for, you know, for clarity. So you are doing the readings, you are engaging the videos, you have some live sessions, then you'll be doing your assessment all concurrently per week. For just this course, and I'm sure the other courses will do say that is not a joke. So do not pile up work. I've said that several times and inform your colleagues, I think, who are not on any of the WhatsApp platforms created. All you need to do is to be on one. And folks already do not want to stick to rules. They are on two of them, some are on three of them. We are trying to do what we can to help you all. So the instructions are just straightforward and simple. You don't need to know why all those instructions are given. I don't need to be telling you all the time. But if you are on two platforms at one, you can even get yourself confused. There is no notice coming from me that will go to one platform and not to the other. It will go to all the others. So stick to the instruction given to you. Before long, you are on two of them. So when I was admitting you into some some session or something, yours couldn't come through because you are two in one. So listen and do, and you will do well. And above all, I believe in it, so I'll communicate that to you. Have some time and pray also, because man can do so much, but when the final arbiter decides, there isn't much he can do. So rely on him. I wish you well. 
in a blessed week until we, we meet again. All the best. <laughs>